Welcome everyone. Old Blue Eyes here, Russ Barkley, with another research update by the Frank Sinatra of ADHD. Just crooning on here, gonna do it my way. Let me get my glasses on and we'll have a look at several articles that were published during the past week that might be noteworthy. There's a bunch of other articles in the thumbnail sketch that you can have a look at, but I thought that these deserved some comment. So let's get started here. The first I just want to say a few words about it has been the publication of practice guidelines for Australia for professionals working there that deal with ADHD. This particular article deals with the role of psychologists as defined in these guidelines. And so I just want to call it to your attention because we do have subscribers from both Australia and New Zealand for whom these practice guidelines are applicable. And you might want to have a look at it because it talks about the various uh, procedures that psychologists can use. Uh, and should use in the evaluation of ADHD. So uh, this particular article uh, appeared in the uh, Journal of the New Zealand College of Clinical Psychologists, uh, and you can see the hot link to it uh, in the thumbnail sketch that accompanies this video. So uh, there you go. Let's uh, keep moving this along quickly. Uh, next up is a study that comes from Turkey, and this is on the extent to which adolescents are participating in community activities. It also goes on to identify uh, what kinds of barriers exist for these adolescents to engage in community activities. Um, so it's a nice paper that involves about 94 teenagers uh, living in Turkey compared to 109 adolescents that did not have ADHD. Uh, and it looks at the frequency, uh, the improvement, or excuse me, the involvement rate, uh, the extent to which mothers wished that their adolescents would change with regard to participating in the community, uh, environmental supports, and, and other issues. Specifically, I want to call your attention to the paragraph in the results section in which they found that the teenagers with ADHD were about 20% less frequently engaged in socializing with peers in the community than were adolescents without ADHD. Uh, and specifically, they found that the extent of involvement uh, in neighborhood outings, in community events, in socializing with peers in the community, and in religious activities was significantly lower in the adolescents with ADHD than in those without. Uh, the paper goes on to conclude that adolescents with ADHD participate less frequently and are less involved in socializing with peers in the community. Almost half of all the adolescents in this study never participate in community events. They believe that the obstacles to participation had to do with cognitive difficulties, sensory qualities, perhaps having to do with the overlap of ADHD with autism spectrum disorder, and safety concerns about the adolescents when away from home. So uh, if you're interested in that particular topic, you might want to go and have a look at this article that appeared in Physical and Occupational Therapy in Pediatrics. Again, the hot link to the study is over in the thumbnail sketch. Up third for our discussion this morning uh, is a paper on the effects of ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder symptoms on the academic performance and eventual educational attainment of individuals with these symptoms. This article appeared in Child Psychiatry and Human Development last week, uh, and it's a huge study using the Finnish population uh, and it's following a northern fin Finland birth cohort uh, that began in 1986 and has followed these individuals up into their uh, 30s at least with uh, all of the information available in their national health registry up through 2018. Uh, let's have a look, close look here at the findings. It says that although symptoms of pure ODD had a negative effect on academic performance at school relative to the control groups used in the study, this effect was weaker than what is seen for pure ADHD symptoms, which, as the study reports, had a much more significant adverse effect 
on school performance. The study found that the group that had both ADHD and ODD symptoms significantly, both males and females in that group, had the greatest deficits overall in educational performance, but especially educational attainment by age 32, and failed to progress to an institution of higher education as often as the control group. Symptoms of ODD specifically in adolescent females predicted educational attainment in adulthood, uh, and this extended no further than compulsory comprehensive school education, meaning that girls with ODD had the greatest likelihood of not going on beyond compulsory education for advanced education. But the group that was most impacted was the comorbid group that had symptoms of both disorders. So a very interesting paper showing the life course outcomes and adverse effects of these two disorders on educational performance and attainment. Very consistent with a sizable literature that exists already on the adverse effects of ADHD on schooling. We're going to wrap it up this week with an article. It's a review that appeared in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry last week. This is yet another meta-analysis on the benefits or lack thereof of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids on the core symptoms of ADHD. Uh, this is a study that reviewed a wide range of publication databases. It found 22 studies that involved over 1,700 participants in their meta-analysis. Overall, as it says here, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids did not significantly improve ADHD core symptoms compared to placebo. They do point out, however, that in a very small subgroup of studies that looked at longer treatment of at least four months with these omega-3 uh, fatty acids, they did find that there was some significant benefit over placebo. It wasn't very substantial, about a third of a standard deviation known as the effect size. Uh, in case you want to put that in comparison, medications produce effect sizes of at least two to three times greater than was seen in that particular subgroup. But overall, the paper concludes that these omega-3 fatty acids do not appear to be effective in the management of ADHD, but they do call for more research using longer periods of treatment that go beyond four months to see if there might be some kind of delayed or sleeper effect here of these uh, fatty acids on managing ADHD symptoms. Uh, so there you have it for this week. Not an awful lot going on out there, though many papers were published, as you'll see in the thumbnail sketch. Uh, they weren't especially important uh, or especially rigorous, and therefore I didn't think were deserving of commentary. Uh, so join me next week, Old Blue Eyes here again, for another research review. Uh, and look forward to brief commentaries appearing throughout the week on special topics. So thanks for joining me, everybody. Uh, if you like the network or the channel, that is, please recommend me to others. And uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please hit the subscribe button so we can keep you updated on any new videos I'll be posting. So thanks, everybody, and be well.